May we request everybody to be seated, please. We will start our humorous speech contest. A reminder, if during the break you use your phone, please put them back on silent, vibrate, or off position. <coughs> Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arm will secure all doors which we did. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving and entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until you determine that all ballots have been collected. Please check if you have any of your devices on, which we have already. Here is the speaking order. Contestant number one, Michael McCoy. <coughs> Contestant number two, Eric Fine and Dijin. Contestant number three, Gerald Lourdes. Contestant number four, Mike Preston. Contestant number five, Kristen Lindbergh. Contestant number six, Tom Keith. We will now proceed with a humorous speech conference. There will be a one minute of silence before the first contestant and between each contestant. Timekeepers, which is on the middle of the aisle, will be advised to do so. Please signal me with a green light when one, one minute is over. After all the contestants <coughs> have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. <coughs> we will now begin our speech contest. Michael McQueen, Dangerous Impulses, Dangerous Impulses, Madam Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, how are you all doing this fabulous evening? Hey. I wish I could tell you it was fabulous, but it's not. An epidemic is sweeping the nation, people. No. I'm not here to talk about our failing economy. I'm here to talk about something that the media has given far less attention to. And those fat cats in Washington were just as soon sweet under the rug. I'm here to talk about, of course, impulse buys. Impulse buys! You know what I'm talking about. You're at the grocery store, you're in the checkout line, you're minding your own business, not hurting anyone. And then all of a sudden, you turn around out of nowhere. Flash. You end up buying a cheap $2 flashlight. It's okay. Everybody can use a little flashlight. But later on that week, I'm at Home Depot. A little leery of the checkout aisle at this point. But something about the place, the music, the aisles, the clever displays, something about it, I get wrapped up in the moment. Before I know it, out of nowhere, boom. <laughs> I had to buy another cheap little flashlight that's remarkably similar to the flashlight I just bought. And I need to get home where it's safe. So I'm home, surfing the internet. That's pretty safe, right? Reading a sports core or something like that. Scroll down, something interesting on this side. Click on something before I know it. Flash. Okay, this one's different. It's got a little solar panel on the side. It's got a little crank. So you can recharge the battery. You can maybe use this in a car or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's remarkably similar to the other class you just bought. And now, I've got to get out of my house. I've got to get out of my house because the internet's in my house. God knows what I'll buy next. So, I get in my car. And I drive. Almost an auto pad. I end up office max. Office bags! I'm in a store! Okay. Well, it's a good <clears throat> You need paper. Paper, paper, paper. No flashlights. No flashlights. End up buying a pen. Okay, a pen. 
with a flashlight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I know what you're thinking. Congress needs to step in and ban the sale of flashlights. Yes! Yes, it's a good idea. But the problem is, it doesn't go far enough, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't. Because consider, look at this watch. This watch is really bright. And uh, did I mention it's bright? I bought this on the internet for a buck fifty. And when I bought it, I thought this would be a good running watch because it's waterproof, and for a dollar fifty, if I break it, really who cares? But if I had given more time into the purchasing decision, it would have occurred to me that it doesn't have a stopwatch, and for a buck fifty, it doesn't really keep time that well. <laughs> Truthfully, I have to go ahead and set the time on the watch before I go on a run and then hope that over the half hour to hour that I'm actually running, that it doesn't do so much time as to render the numbers completely meaningless. But, it was only a buck fifty. Okay, plus five dollar shipping and handling. There was, there was the five dollar shipping and handling I might not mention, but... But that was for the whole order. That five dollars was for the whole order. So when you consider it that way, I would almost... This is only a buck fifty, so I'd be crazy not to order more than one of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not alone here, am I? No, I'm not. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. A friend of mine has a similar situation that when he goes drinking, when he gets drunk, invariably, at the end of the day, he comes home, he gets on the internet, and orders himself a pair of Adidas running shoes. Now, First blush sounds okay. Adidas makes a fine product. Nothing wrong with it. But he now owns 30 pairs. <laughs> and he doesn't run. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking now. Because we're close. I know. Feel me. You're thinking that Congress should step in and we should ban the internet. Again, bold thinking. I like it. I applaud your, your active outside the box thinking. But again, it doesn't go far enough, does it? It doesn't, because you know, as soon as you do that, there will be a traveling salesman camped outside my friend's door, following him to the bar, and then, when he's drunk, when he's at his weakest, his most vulnerable, he will bury him in Adidas running shoes. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we live in America, and in America, we set up laws to protect us from ourselves. That's why I hope to propose you today that Congress enact a new 10 minute waiting period before the purchase of anything. <laughs> I know it seems a little bit extreme, but consider that many states already have a required waiting period of several days before the purchase of firearms. And let's face it people, impulse buys can be every bit as dangerous. <laughs> now, as with any new piece of legislation, there will be your small but vocal group of protesters. They'll protest, they'll pick it, they'll lobby. You know they'll lobby. They'll be over there with those fat cats in Washington, giving them candy bars and magazines and little trinkets, bribing them with impulse buys. And then they'll bring out the big guns, the economists. And the economists will tell you, well, we might like this law, but if people take more time to think about things before they buy them, they won't buy as much. It's not good for the economy. So as much as we might want to pass this bill, we simply can't afford it. Can't afford it? Ladies and gentlemen, how can we afford not to pass it?
Madam Toastmaster, one minute. Thank you. Eric Benedigan, a little white line, a little white line, Eric Benedigan. on your shirt, you catch all the red lights going to work, and then there's that one thing that just ruins your whole day. And a Toastmaster, full of Toastmasters, not our guests. Not too long ago, I had my one thing. In case you're wondering, it wasn't having to take the prostate exam, <laughs> or having to go to jury duty. It was being subjected to the modern instrument of torture. The dreaded lie detector machine. <laughs> yeah, I had to take it for work. For those of you that haven't had the pleasure of being hooked up to one of these things, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> because as bad as the test is, it's the moments before that are even worse. Let me paint the picture for you. Imagine, if you will, you're brought into a room with no windows. Nothing like this, trust me. You're strapped to a wooden chair, hooked up to a blood pressure monitor, given a sweat rag because, trust me, you're going to need it. <laughs> the whole time this thing is looking at you as if to say, I'm going to get you. <laughs> then a detective comes in and says, Sir, please, try not to be nervous. <laughs> try not to be nervous, I'm strapped to a chair. <clears throat> the only thing I can compare it to is having to come up here give your icebreaker speech, and then suddenly realizing you forgot your notes! Ah! Both experiences lead you to therapy. And I know the name of good shrink if you need one. But I'll never forget it. For weeks, I was stressing out about this exam. The day finally came for me to take the test. When I got to the testing facility, I found myself walking down a long hallway so I got to a door with a sign on it that read, Warning, polygraph testing in progress, push button to enter. Warning, okay, now I'll admit it, that really freaked me out. I immediately thought, I can't do this. But then I thought, Eric, be cool, be calm. You're a Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked back up to that button, my coolest, calmest most confident Toastmaster voice. I pushed that button and I said, Hi, I'm here for the polygraph test! <laughs> <laughs> I am here for the polygraph test? Can you let me in? But then it came to two more signs. One said, politicians and criminals, this way. <laughs> Job screenings, this way. <laughs> I don't want to join the Illinois governors. I'll go to my job screening. But here's my question. Why do we need these things anyways? I mean, everyone lies, right? She's thinking, Eric, don't be looking at me. <laughs> but I'll prove it to you. Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie before. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. See, at least we can all be honest about lying. <laughs> Let me know if these sound familiar. Anytime you end a relationship or break up with someone, you say, Honestly, it's not you. It's me. <laughs> or when you <laughs> you see that somebody? Trust me, I'm not sick. It's just allergies. <laughs> you know what? It goes both ways. We even get lied too. Come on, anytime you call customer service, that voice ball kicks on. We're currently experiencing higher than normal call volume, but your call is important to us. Yeah, right. We know the temp is out to lunch. <laughs> Or when you go to the doctor's office, they put you in that room, the nurse comes in, the doctor will be right in to see you when pigs fly. You're going to be in that room so long that your insurance policy is going to expire. <laughs> Nevertheless, if you ever find yourself hooked up to one of these things, I'm going to show you how to beat it. You didn't expect this tonight, did you? <laughs> 
So I find the blood pressure monitor here. Turn this puppy on. Uh oh. Okay, now this is embarrassing. It looks like the machine has malfunctioned. I'm gonna need a volunteer from the audience to come up and help me with this wire. Ava? Okay, here we go. Yep, give her a round of applause. Just so we can hear, go ahead and flip on real quick. All right. Now, I lied. I actually don't need you to hold the wire. I need you to answer a few questions. <laughs> but, but you'll be painless. Trust me. You trust me, don't you? Okay. You try not. You're a toastmaster. <laughs> you try not to be nervous. Okay. Just put your finger right here. Oh no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Now, the first two questions I want you to answer honestly when you hear this sound. What is your first name? Barry. So far, so good. And the town that you live in? Chicago. Okay, so we passed that part. Things working fine. Now, these are the dishonest questions. So I want you to answer yes. Are you seven feet tall? Yes. Okay, you can hear that noise. We're working, working well so far. Did you once meet Michael Jordan in a game of one-on-one? -on -one? Yes. <laughs> okay, all right, so so far so good. Now here's the control question. This is going to determine if this is working or not. This is the funniest speech you've ever heard, and I'm going to win this contest. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, let's go. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're out of time. So I can't share all the tips and techniques. However, I will, I will share this with you. Something I tell my four year old daughter all the time, what this has taught me in this experience in this machine. It will always serve you well to tell the truth. Thank you for listening. You've been a great audience. Madam Toastmaster, one minute. Thank you. Gerald Flores. Mr. Chip. Mr. Chippy. Gerald Flores. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters. Yes. When my wife Annie and I drove into the driveway, we saw our sitter Hannah running with our three-year-old daughter in her arms yelling, RATS! 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 I told Annie to go get Hannah while I would go inside and see what the problem was. When I entered, I saw my seven-year-old son, Chris, standing in the living room. Chris, I said, what's going on here? Aw, oh, Dad, he said. It was only a chipmunk. It got in when I opened the door to the garage, and when Hannah saw it, she freaked. We're not being a big fan of these tunneling rodents. I asked Chris where the chipmunk was now. In the kitchen, he said. Ah, Chris, I told him, go get your hockey stick while I go get my bath. 
For you White Sox fans, this is the bat that Adam Dunn used this season. It's practically like new. There's hardly a ballpark on it. I also took off my shoes and socks to ensure maximum maneuverability. The hunt was on! I positioned Chris by the doorway, and I told him to be prepared to stop the chipmunk. Just pretend it's a brown puck, I said, and swing hard! As I entered the kitchen, I saw the chipmunk sitting on the countertop with its back towards me. Stealthily, I tiptoed closer, cocked the bat, and brought it down as hard as I could. Great plan, except I forgot about the globe light fixture that hung out <laughs> the ceiling just above the counter. The force of my blow shattered the globe, littering the floor with shards of glass and sending a vase of tulips crashing to the floor. The chipmunk shot for the doorway. However, with all this glass on the floor, a lot of it hidden by tulips, and me without shoes, I had to carefully tiptoe across the floor. Ah! Oh! I wonder if Tiny Tim ever had this problem. <laughs> when I got to the doorway, I asked Chris if he had seen the chipmunk. No, Dad, I didn't. When was the last time we got this on kid's eyes checked, I thought to myself. <laughs> but before I could say anything, I heard chattering and looked up and saw the chipmunk sitting on the top step to the stairs leading to the bedrooms. The chipmunk was sitting on its haunches, chattering, as if scolding me for trying to take a swipe at it. Go ahead, I growled. Make my day. I positioned Chris at the top of the stairs while I headed for the master bedroom where the chipmunk had subsequently shot into. As I entered, I saw the chipmunk sitting on the bed our bed, and on my side to boot. <laughs> I took the bat back and I swung for the fences. Unfortunately, the bat connected with the lamp on the nightstand before it could connect with the chipmunk. The chipmunk shot for the door. Chris, I yelled, enemy headed your way. I started racing after the chipmunk just as Chris was unleashing his slap shot, which to my horror, missed the chipmunk by a country mile, but set connected solidly with my right hand. Eventually the pain subsided. God, I thought I gotta get this kid's eyes checked. <laughs> I ran into the family room where the chipmunk had shot into and frantically began to search for it. Suddenly, I heard Annie yell. What's going on here? I just tried to get rid of a chipmunk, I said. Permanently, she asked, as she looked at the hockey stick that Chris was holding and the bat that I was holding. Haven't you ever heard of Chip and Dale, she demanded. Uh. What's furniture got to do with all this? <laughs> well, the day did not end well. Somehow, Annie sweet-talked Mr. Chippy outside and reprimanded Chris and me for trying to hurt the chipmunk. <laughs> this ain't over yet, he thought to myself. As for Hannah, Annie sat her down and showed her pictures of chipmunks and rats, pointing out critical differences, and all the while cooing, the chipmunks are the cute ones! Yeah! <laughs> that night, I dreamed about hunting chipmunks, and even caught one, which, unfortunately, to my wife's horror and disgust, was her arm. <laughs> Well, at least I didn't have the bat. <laughs> Several weeks later, I was way in the backyard cleaning up. 
when I heard Annie yell at me from the kitchen window. I haven't seen the chipmunk lately, have you? Turning towards her, I yelled back, Why, no, I haven't! <laughs> Madam Toastmaster, one minute. Thank you. Mike first here. Grant us wait. Grant us wait. Hit 
that little scam. All of Mass Starts hit the floor. And I thought, oh boy. Bent down, right behind me. Get those envelopes up. That's when I heard it. <laughs> Shot back. I felt air conditioning where there should be no air conditioning. <laughs> I was like a bird on a perch. I went, <laughs> what just happened? Now, I had to have a plan. I've got to exit out of here. I'm in the front of the room. There's about 150 to 200 people sitting just like you are. So I eased myself, hoping that only the flower arrangement could see the back of me. I got to this wall. I started easing down that aisle. <coughs> Couches and chairs. Thank God no one was sitting there. People were stopping me. Mike, I haven't seen you in so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, I got something. I'll talk to you later. I got to the back. I found my sister. And I said, "Go find mom, because mom's a seamstress. Do you know what seamstress have in their purses? Needle and thread, of course." So I said, "Go find mom." I just ripped my pants off. She went to find my mother, and just at that moment, in walked the parish. Making an announcement as he proceeded down the aisle. Please take a chair. It's time for the prayer. Can you imagine that dilemma? Mm -hmm. The last thing I wanted to do was sit in a chair at that moment. I didn't know what my pants would look like. Probably the flag at the end of the attack on Fort Sumter. <laughs> <laughs> so I proceeded to get against the back wall at the door. It looked like a bodyguard. It was a Sicilian wake. I didn't think they'd think it was odd. <laughs> so, the prayer went on. When the prayer was over, I called my sister again. Please, my mom. Mom came. She said, I have a plan. I said, good, because I, I was out of plans. She said, go down the hallway to the bathroom. Take your pants off and hand them out. I'll sew them up. You know, where's the wear? So, I sit down in the bathroom. First time I ever went in that bathroom. I walked in that bathroom, and to my horror, there was a couch, there was a payphone, there was a big silver ashtray, a guy sitting all over smoking cigarettes, and another door in the stalls. And I thought, this plan is not going to work too well. If I have to go in that stall, take my pants off, come out in my shirts and my jockeys, hand them out the door, and then just lean against the wall like it's just natural. <laughs> So I came out the door and I said, Mom, that's not going to work. She said, come on. Back to the window. There's a closet there. You go in that closet. Well, it was a double door closet. One side was latched, one side was open. People were putting coats in there. It was not cold. It was cold. In the closet I went. And the pants out. Mom went over this way somewhere to a couch. I couldn't see the door shutters. You know? People were coming to either put their coats in or get them out. And my hand would come up. With a hanger. <laughs> I don't know if they thought I was Lurch or who. <laughs> they didn't say anything. They just grabbed, they just grabbed the hanger. Oh, came back. Now, my uncle was working the room. Come on, you gotta see my, my nephew, Mike. He's back in the closet with his pants off. <laughs> he was bringing people back on tours. <laughs> my mother got the pants sewed. While she was sewing the pants, I could hear people. Oh, Angie. Sorry, dear. What are you doing? I'm sewing my son Michael's pants. He's in the closet with no pants. <laughs> she sewed him up. He was all over. Every week that I've been to since that day. Somebody puts up somebody that I don't know, and they're usually 20 something in block, comes up and taps me on the back and says, Michael, are you going to rip your pants for us again? <laughs> so I leave you with you be the judge. You think Grandpa was finally laughing? <laughs> <laughs>
Madam Toastmaster, one minute. Thank you. Kristen Lindbergh, it annoys me. It annoys me.
understanding language. <laughs> but then, things took a turn for worse. A mother called her and said, there's no RSVP on this invitation. How will you know how many goodie bags to make? <laughs> Elizabeth eventually recovered, but she still bears the scars. <laughs> the pressure is everywhere. Your son is invited to a magic themed birthday party, and David Copperfield is the magician. <laughs> Your child is invited to a circus themed birthday party and is whisked downtown in a limo for a performance of Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> Your daughter is invited to a makeover party and comes home looking like a real housewife of Beverly Hills. <laughs> Worse than coming home with a bag full of useless plastic junk, they come home with a goodie bag that rivals an Oscar party swag bag. <laughs> and you, holding on to your principles by a thread, you refuse to throw a matchbox car, a couple of pieces of bazooka, and a Tootsie Pop in a plastic bag for your child's guests. What are you to do about the mothers who keep upping the ante? <coughs> What can you say to that whiny brat who, after you've entertained them and fed them for two hours, still demand to know, where's the buddy bags? <laughs> well, all I know is first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being, damn it, and my life has value. <laughs> so right now, I want you to get up, I want you to get out of those chairs, I want you to go to a window that opens. <laughs> I want you to open it. I want you to stick your head out. And I want you to say, I'm mad as hell. And I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> Either that, or you tell the whitey brat there's no goodie bags at this birthday party and send him home. <laughs> Toastmaster, one minute. Some kid, if the smoke and the sun don't get me, the medical procedure will. If the smoke and the sun don't get me, the medical procedure will. Hello, Toastmasters and honored guests. I've been told that I'm a borderline hypochondriac. It's true that when I was growing up, I constantly ran to my mom with mysterious aches and pains, which she would always diagnose in the same way. She would take my temperature, poke and prod the area that I said was hurting, ask me to stick out my tongue and say, ah, ah. And then she would usually say the same thing. You're fine. It's probably just growing pains. Suck it up and go to school. But it wouldn't be long before I had researched some new ailment that I knew I was dying of and run back to her. Now the downside of all that research is that to this day, I constantly worry about things that I've done to myself and the health benefits and the things that have gone wrong because of choices I've made. Take smoking, for example. I first tried cigarettes in the Chicago Alley in the 1960s with two friends and a pack of stolen cigarettes. 
we decided to see who could smoke the most cigarettes at the same time. <laughs> Harmless fun. <laughs> At least I thought until high school health class. When all of a sudden I saw these pictures of lungs blackened by smoke. And I heard about how smoking damages the heart and the other organs. I knew I had done irreparable harm to myself through that smoking. In fact, it was just a week later. I was struggling to finish the dreaded two mile run in health class. My side was burning. I had to stop. I said, Coach, I can't go on. I got a pain. I'm sure it's a lung tumor. <laughs> he came up to me, poked and prodded a little bit. And he said, hmm, it's growing pains. Suck it up and keep running. <laughs> if the smoking doesn't get me, the sun sure will. That's what I thought about recently at work when we had a presentation on skin cancer. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't worry about what the sun was doing to us. In fact, with movies like Beach Blanket Bingo and bands like the Beach Boys, we were taught that the suntan was a sign of being hip. And I was going <coughs> to be the hippest guy in the neighborhood. <laughs> so every day, I slathered on the oil, and I lay in my driveway from 9 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, <laughs> feeling the burn. Yeah, I was feeling it as I was sitting in that conference room, worried about what I was going to hear. <coughs> now, presentations like that to hypochondriacs are a great source of new information about things to be worried about. <laughs> and in this case, the presentation also was a source of free salad and pasta, thanks to our HR. <laughs> the presenter wasted no time starting the slideshow, and I wasted no time listening <coughs> to the free food. In fact, I had taken a big mouthful when I heard her say the word melanoma. And for some reason, I decided to look at the screen where this sunburned, prune-faced man with oozing cancerous sores stared back at me. And those sores seemed to shout at me, We're coming for you! No! I shouted, the food spewing on the person next to me. Now I don't remember much else from the rest of the presentation. Just two things. The sun is good, just not on our skin. And I should always cover my mouth when I eat. A few days after that presentation, I woke up with a pain in my side. I knew it had to be serious. So I went to my doctor, who took my temperature, poked and prodded, asked me to stick out my tongue and say, ah. And then he said, Tom, I think we have to do a procedure. Yes! <laughs> what do we got to do, Doc? He said, we'll just give you this shake. You'll drink it, and the technician will see what's going on inside. Okay, what's in the shake? Barium. Why did my doctor think that I would get excited about drinking radioactive isotopes, even if the shake was called a very, very, barium shake? I didn't get it! But I did try the shake, and then later I was laying on this machine. It was making this weird clicking sound. <coughs> later, I got my bill for my deductible portion, $865, and I realized what the clicking was. It was like a meter on a taxi cab. <laughs> He called me a few days later with the results. Everything in the area we scanned looked good, but we thought we saw a shadow on your spleen. I'd like to do another procedure. What am I going to have to drink this time? Oh no, don't worry. This time we'll just inject the radioactive material directly into your bloodstream. Great! So I was laying on a different machine with this technician hovering over. Now, fresh from his rotation at the Guantanamo Bay detention camp, the technician had this unique bedside manner. We can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. The easy way is if you don't move. Because if you move, you blur. And we got to start all over. And I want your arms out of the way. Get them up over your head, like this. Now, you could try this if you want. It's comfortable for about a minute. After about five minutes, my muscles were starting to tighten. And after 15 minutes, 
My muscles were twitching and aching and pulling. I knew I had to do something. And so I remembered contortionists in a circus one time who could move. And I said, maybe I could do this without alerting the guard. I, I mean the technician. <laughs> I said, contortionists in a circus get paid for this. But I'm paying for this torture. <laughs> How much? Let's just say that my family took a staycation this year. <laughs> and when people say, what'd you do this summertime? I say, oh, you want to see the pictures for my liver spleen scan? <laughs> the doctor called me a few days later into the office and said, everything looks great. It looks like it was just some growing pains. <laughs> I'll just lose some weight and suck it up. <laughs> I left his office with mixed emotions, knowing that if the smoke and the sun don't get me, the medical procedures will. <laughs> Everyone can please remain silent for the judges to complete their ballots.
And when I return to my desk, I really feel like I went somewhere, even though it was only down the hall in the conference room. Thank you so much, and thank you. Hi, Dan. Um, what club? How long? I can't hear it. Could you say it again? <laughs> what? Uh, see, I'm with Club 4704. How long have you been at Toastmasters? I've been at Toastmasters about five years. And what do you like about Toastmasters? Uh, I like the opportunity to be able to give speeches and become better speaking in a safe environment. <laughs> That's so good. Thank you so much. Uh, what club and how long have you been at Toastmaster? I'm with the Granger Club called Figures of Speech, 1856, up in the forest, and I've been with Toastmasters for 15 years. Thank you. And what's the most interesting experience you have with Toastmasters? Uh, the most interesting experience I've had is uh, in January when I went to China on business, I had an opportunity to visit Toastmasters Club in China and meet with the, it was actually five clubs got together for one meeting, and it was a really unique international experience. Thank you. Uh, what club and how long have you been at Toastmasters? I'm at the Baxter Toastmasters Club, and I've been with Toastmasters for about six and a half years now. And what do you like about Toastmasters, other than the ladies? <laughs> <laughs> That's part of it. But anyway, uh, just the ability to be able to, to give speeches, to evaluate speeches, and to really practice your speaking skills. You know when we give speeches to audience, we're always nervous, no matter what. And it really takes a lot of practice to get rid of that nervousness and also to learn how to give effective speeches, it helps you with your work, it helps you with your communication with friends, and it's a great learning experience, and it's not in a free, not intimidating environment. What club and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm with uh, Anne Glenview, I'm right here at and uh, I've been in about three years. What do you like about Toastmasters? Well, I like trying to speak publicly, but also it's been great for networking and meeting people in, in the company that I normally would not meet at all. <laughs> what club and how and uh, how long have you been at Toastmasters? I'm part of uh, the club number 665. Uh, it is called the Niles Toastmasters Club. Our president, Sang, is over here. <laughs> the chair of the year with the give models a vote. And how long have you been at Toastmaster? Since last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many things. <laughs> right? One wonderful thing about Toastmasters is that it gives me energy and gives me the tips and tools and techniques so to make me a better communicator. So if anyone who has not joined yet over here, I would urge you to join Postmaster. Our evaluation contestants, let's give them a hand. And the impending 
fame that I expect will soon be hitting all of us. <laughs> Lake County Toastmasters, shout out to everybody. 652972, and I've been involved seven and a half years. And what do you like about Toastmasters? I love coming to these contests and getting a lot of good material that I can steal and use in my everyday life. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Thank you so much. communications with Donnelly or Northbrook and we've been incorporated like five months so I've been a member for five months and my whole team is only five months. Old.
because we have a very secret but special lunchtime performance coming that I can't quite share. But I will tell you that it is because, as you know, Postmasters Leadership Institute is a free benefit as part of your membership program. And you would pay big money to hear these laughing people talk to you. And you're going to want to go. So I would highly recommend that you mark it down on your calendar and watch. What is that website thing again called? Who knows the URL? D30 Chicago. And you cannot wait to find out who's going to be laughing at lunch with us, and there's even more fun things there. But let's digress back to the November 12th event. Because if your club has not yet enrolled, you want to make sure to do so before Halloween. Not because Freddy Krueger will be visiting you, but because the early bird registration of $99 for your entire club to go will expire. Freddy Krueger rings your doorbell. Not to offer a treat if you didn't register, but probably to trick you with a higher price for not enrolling soon enough. And you're probably wondering, Michelle, I can't wait to go with my club. But tell me about the meal prices, because sometimes at conferences, it's expensive to eat there. And you definitely want to hear Darren LaCroix for free at the meals. How much does it cost? Well, we have a deal for you. If you go on the website before Halloween is over and register for lunch, you will be paying only $10 at the Marriott Renaissance and O'Hare, which is an extremely low price. And no, it is not ramen noodles for lunch. <laughs> it's a yummy deli sandwich, chips, and a soda for $10. That's a killer deal. <laughs> I know. Two years ago, it was $30 for lunch. $10. You're probably wondering, well, that's great, Michelle, but I want to hear Darren speak at dinner, and I want to know who won the humorous speech contest. How much is it to go for dinner? Now, you're probably wondering what our first negotiation price would was at Marriott. In fact, you probably really don't care. I want to hear one tonight, but I'm going to tell you anyway. They originally quoted us $80 a person for dinner. Wow. I'm thinking, that will not work. That's more than attending the conference for a group. What could we do? Lo and behold, $35 per person. And no, it is not McDonald's hamburger. Michelle's cooking. I think. Uh, <laughs> call 911. Okay. But you get the choice of a yummy chicken, a whole like, chicken breast, not just half, and or pasta for fish. So how good is that? And you can hear Darren talk and find out if one of the first contest at the district level. How fun is that? Yes. I know. And finally, before you hear who won, I have to just tell you about the other exciting quick incentives. Because clearly the most exciting part is hearing me finish. So some of you may know about the high five challenge. Now this is important to you because Postmasters released for the first time in 87 years a brand new brand. Now, I know they did it to sell more banners. No, they didn't. Because now, of course, you know we're where leaders are made. And that means that all of us have to trade in all of our banners for brand new ones. And you're going to want to do this. You're going to want to win because new club banners cost $100. $100. That's more than going to the fall conference. <laughs> but you can get one for free. And I know you're wondering, dying to know, when is she going to stop talking? Well, all you need to do to win the High Five Challenge and hear me stop talking is five small things as a club. First of all, you have to achieve the five DCP Distinguished Club Program points. And those are, because I know you're dying in suspense, the first two points are two, two CCs, CCs, right? So put four CCs. And then two more points for advanced communicators. Points three and four, and one leadership award. Now, how many of you said you were going to the Achievers Breakfast at the Fall Conference? All of you should have your hands up! And that means that all of the clubs in the North should be winning the High Five Challenge and getting a free club banner. And not only will be you getting this great educational award at breakfast for yourself, but your club will get this great banner. And in April, when the international president comes to visit us for the 
first time in many, many years, your club could march up for the banner parade with new ribbons and a brand new banner and win for the next conference for free attendance. How many of you want to do it?
also, once again, Carol, thank you so much for hosting us here at Presbyterian Home. It is a beautiful site, and thank you so much for, for hosting us. There will be a new conference pretty soon.